Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome back to this course on uh, the psychology of language. This is lecture number 3 and what we are going to do in this lecture is we will look at how do we do research in language sciences or in psycholinguistics. Now when I say how do we do research in psycholinguistics, the methods that I am going to tell you here is not explicitly the one that we use in language studies. Now, these methods are very well commonly used across a number of other scientific disciplines. So, some of the principles, some of the facts that I am going to reveal here is common to most of the behavioral sciences or social sciences. Before we start our journey today and start looking at how do we do research in the science of language, let us do a quick recap of what we did in the first two lectures, lecture number 1 and lecture number 2. Now, lecture number 1 and lecture number 2 we focused on how language evolved and even before that we started looking at the nature of language, what is it. So, the best way to define language is basically a medium of communication between people, a medium of expressing of ideas between two entities. So, we started off the beginning of these lecture series by defining what is the definition of language. We started out by pinpointing how communication and languages are different and we started seeing or we started our lectures by looking at the most primitive form of language known to human beings which is animal communication. So, we started looking at animal communication systems. We started looking at why animals communicate and what kind of communication systems exist in animals. From there, we devised or underlined certain rules on which animal communication systems really work. We looked at reasons like food, finding mates or uh, find, uh, pointing out enemies and these are the reasons why animals use a communication system. We then moved on to the development of human language, how human language developed from animal communication systems. So, there we looked the example of laugh as a language. So, how laughing or smiling is a model of a language. So, we took that as a model and we describe what it is and how laugh never means that something funny is been spoken, but laugh has multiple meanings and that is what we tried to or I tried to explain through how language, human language is different from animal communication. Animal communication pinpoints here and now things or very basic ideas. Whereas, if you look at the laugh that we have in humans, it is not actually pointing out to the fact that something funny is being said. It can sometimes mean I like you, it can sometimes mean that I support your views or your ideas or so many other things. So, the simple laugh that we have or smile that we have can mean so many things. And so, we took this model system and explained to you how animal languages or uh, animal communications differ from human languages. Then we looked at various features of the human language system and how do they vary from animal communication system. For example, the nature of sentence structure, the nature of uh, arbitrary symbols and the nature of production. So, this is how because animals can communicate on limited ideas and their, their way of communication is not structured in any way, they are not governed by certain rules. So, we pointed out that and we also saw that how arbitrary symbols which is words in different languages mean the same concept or mean the same idea that we are expressing. Then we also looked at how human languages progress 
And there we pointed out at something called duality of patterning, we saw how basic units add up to form longer languages. So, basically how basic units combine together to give bigger units in languages. We then looked at the standard paramedical structure, the pyramidal structure of language in terms of the phonemes, the morphemes, the uh, words, the sentence and the discourse, the syntax, semantics and the discourse. So, we looked at how this is built about. We pointed out or looked briefly into the fact of how language evolved, the evolution of language, how did it start. So, we looked at the proto-humans, the Neanderthal mans, the homo sapiens and how they developed a proto-language and how this proto-language developed into the fully formed language that we think about. And we also gave enough evidences to point out that this kind of evolution would have been uh, possible. The very existence of Pidgin which is a language which has limited scope but then can express ideas among two communities which are not common in language gives a strong support to the fact that language would have evolved from the proto language. We looked at the process of recursion which is very uh, basic to the idea of language, how sentences are longer sentences are formed. So, the same set of rules or the same set of uh, structure is repeated to form longer sentences. So, we looked at that as well. Then we looked at how syntaxes are formed and we looked at certain uh, evidences of both the continuity and discontinuity of theory of language. Continuity theory of language believes that language developed as a gradual process through several stages from animals uh, to humans and to higher humans. This continuity three believes that out of a single mutation language evolved very rapidly and so we saw how these theories are and what they prompt and what kind of evidences they are based on. And then we looked at certain kind of uh, uh, reasoning or evidences for the fact that language evolved uh, in a sequential manner through a uh, fossilized structure. So, basically how they evolved or how they uh, uh, developed in, in, a, uh, in a chain sequence uh, right from the, uh, uh, the, the basic communication that the proto humans were using to the modern language. So, that is what we did in the first two lectures. We looked at the evolution, we looked at how they are different from the present language system is different from animal language systems and we provided evidences looked at some primary theories of language development and that kind of thing. Now, having said that the first thing that we need to know in any uh, course is to know what are the uh, tools and what are the techniques which are available to conduct research in that particular area or in that particular field and that is what we are absolutely now going to do in this part of the course. We are going to see the tools and techniques which are available to us which help us in doing research in language. So, I will start with a brief story and I will show to you how language research is done and then we will look at the procedures and techniques which are available for doing research. Now, in this story we first start off by describing what is an ERP and event related potential. And so, these ERPs or event related potentials are changes in the brain electrical potential due to changes in perception of certain stimuli. Now, we will take the story of how the N400 which is a negative going peak, how this was developed or this was found out by someone called Martha Kutus in the lab laboratory of Hillard. So, both are prominent psycholinguists and N400 was a waveform 
which was developed by Marta Kutis before the development of N400, the P300 was the signature of language comprehension or language understanding. Now, let us look at a little bit of detail of what the ERP is and why it is needed in that kind of a thing. So, the brain at any point of time is doing a lot of activities. If we want to know how the brain is processing certain stimuli, we have to study or we have to look at the electrical changes which is happening in the brain while a stimuli is being presented or after the presentation of a particular stimuli and compare it with a state when no stimuli is presented. And then what we do is we cut off those section of the EEG which is of interest to us. So, normally if this is what my EEG is, a normal EEG looks like and if I present my stimulus here and in other case I do not present a stimulus, what I do is I take let us say if my area of interest is 1000 millisecond and I believe that within the 1000 millisecond some changes will happen. What I will do is I will take this EEG or this kind of EEG by presenting the stimulus to let us say 1000 people and then again presenting no stimulus to 1000 people. I will average them and from this average I will be able to separate the basic waveforms of the brain at the default stage and cut off those or find out those changes in electrical potential which are coming from the presentation of the stimulus. How do we do that? We compare no stimulus versus stimulus condition and so we will be able to know how does brain or what areas of the brain or what regions of the brain, what processes in the brain are active while doing a particular uh, 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 processing or while doing a particular cognitive task. And so, what, what was happening is the most in, in sentence comprehension, now sentence comprehension is something that we will, we will see in, in uh, the future coming classes. So, basically how does the brain read a sentence? How does the brain extract meaning from a sentence? Now, what was happening is that it was well known before Marta Cortes came in and, gave and, and found out that there is something called N400. Before that, a lot of research was done and those in EEG and it was found out that there is something called a P300 wave. A P300 wave is a positive going wave, 300 millisecond. So, if this is where the stimulus is presented, 300 millisecond after the presentation of the stimulus what I see is a deviation on the positive direction. Of course, EEGs are read in the wrong side. So, this is my positive and this is my negative. And so, this deviation after 300 millisecond basically suggests and so, this is the average deviation that I get. And so, this basically explains or this basically uh, tells me about one common feature of uh, the stimuli of interest. The stimuli of interest was how the brain processes those sentences in which something unexpected happens. And so, the, the uh, question of interest here was processing a simple statement. The statement that, that was processed is she put on her high heel Now, as you will note that till here it is in small letters and then suddenly the shoe comes in capital letters and so this is what the deviation is. And so, for this kind of deviations or oddball as we call them, the brain reveals a P300 uh, deflection. This P300 deflection says that when the, when the brain comes to this part, it is able to notice the difference between capitals and smalls. So, this is in the in terms of the sentence structure, syntactic structure, the sentence structure. But what happens when the meaning is wrong in a sentence? For example, let us look at this. So, C spreads the warm bread with socks. Now, as you can see the moment you read this sentence, you come to know that this is wrong. This should not be there and this is called the clauser 
uh, effect and so uh, what it really means is that people are able to predict what kind of words will come next. We will we'll look at these in, in the coming lectures. So, people have this ability of predicting what words come next <coughs> and so as soon as a sentence like this is given the brain is able to notice this difference. Now, this difference is in as, as you can see the difference here is in terms of the sentence structure. So, it is capitals and it is smalls, but here the all are in capitals the problem is in terms of meaning and so when this happens Martha Kutas found out that she is not getting a P300 rather what she was getting is that right from the start of the stimulus 400 millisecond past the stimulus she was getting a if this is my EEG an average EEG across multiple subjects this is what she was getting a deflection in the negative so it is called the N400 a negative deflection 400 milliseconds past the presentation of the stimulus or this kind of words. So, basically then if structure wise differences are there the brain gives a positive 300 deflection, but if a meaning wise uh, a meaning related uh, change is there a meaning related problem occurs in a sentence uh, N400 is resultant or the deflection is in the 400 negative side. Now, what does this really mean or why does this is of interest? It is of interest because the brain processes syntactic structures and semantic forms in different ways. This is for the first time that we are able to see that brain processes the meaning and structures of sentences in different ways. This is one kind of research that we do in language and so this is an ERP and EEG research that we do in uh, language and so from there on these two basic the P300, P300 which is called the oddball component of the EEG and the N400 which is the semantic component marking the semantic component are the two primary components which have been widely used in uh, sentence uh, production and sentence uh, uh, comprehension. Now, there is something called N100 also, but this is an attentional uh, component and so we are not bringing it here. So, why all this thing it was to show you what kind of research is <coughs> possible in language and what kind of things are possible in language. Now, let us look at how is basically research done in language and as I said these principles that I am going to tell you here is not common to just language studies or psycholinguistics it can be used with any behavioral or social sciences. So, the first thing before we do research in, in any uh, behavioral science or in language for specifically this matter we need to explain or we need to understand what a theory is before finding up a problem or we, before doing research in language we have to first look at a theory because a gap in the theory will provide you a problem of interest on which you want to do a research. So, what is theory then? What is the definition of a theory? A theory is believed to provide a conceptual framework for explaining a set of observations. So, it is a conceptual framework which explains a set of observations and that is that is what we need to have here. So, basically the theory it is research evidence or it is kind of a proposal a background knowledge which gives the reason or which provides the reason or evidence for any kind of observations that we have. And so, the observation that we saw right now the N400 and the P300 there are lots of theories which says that there are different regions of the brain that process it and there are different time frames. Now, the P400 the N400 and P300 are two things the P300 is more of an attentional component and so meaning is not derived and so uh, this happens very early on, but the N400 <coughs> requires the brain to access the meaning of the word the concept of the word and for that the, uh, the abstract concept or the lemma of the word and for that particular reason what it has to do is this kind of activities happen late in the processing. It happens at the temporal lobe or the medio temporal lobe and so it will happen late 
and also there will be a positive deflection and the negative deflection. So, basically the theory gives you the reason. So, the medial temporal lobe is the secondary structure or where memories are there or where semantic memory is stored and so for this kind of variations or this kind of uh, uh, verification in terms of meaning is stored in semantic memory. Whereas, looking at just the capitals and smalls is more or less of an attentional feature and so that is why it happens early on and so this is the kind of theory that we can give for the kind of uh, research that has been uh, displayed or that I have explained to you before starting this lecture. So, theory gives the reason or the, or the evidence or the baseline on which a research is done. Now, it should make predictions about future. Now, what the theory does is not only explanation explain a set of observations, it also predicts the future observations. So, basically if a set of observation, if an experiment is done, a theory provides it enough evidence of why this is coming. N the theory does not uh, only do that, it also gives you enough reason or it also gives you uh, the line of approach to do newer set of experiments to uh, predict what future observations can come or what uh, make predictions about if you vary something in, in the initial experiment, what kind of results are you going to get. And these experiments th that could be tested in experiments. So, this is what a theory does. There are two main purposes of theory explaining observations and explaining future observations and how these can be explained by experiments. Now, after the theory we come to know about or we come at the level of what a hypothesis is. So, what is a hypothesis? A hypothesis generally is a tentative solution to a problem or a prediction which is based on a theory about a solution to a problem. So, let us say I have a <coughs> problem, the problem is how the brain interprets meaning and, syntax and, and syntactic or rules uh, at the meaning level and at the surface level of sentence processing. If I have a theory that there are two different ways in which the brain handles that, hypothesis are predictions which basically uh, give solutions to the fact that how the brain is actually doing it or what are the possible solutions to this problem. So, a prediction that is derived from a theory is basically known as a hypothesis. So, basically what a hypothesis is? It is a prediction which is derived from a theory and so these are tentative solutions. Tentative solutions in the sense that this may not be the correct solution, but this is a possible solution. Once a hypothesis is laid, once a solution is laid, what the researcher then does is collects data based on the prediction of the theory and then verifies the hypothesis or test the hypothesis to test the theory. So, whether the theory is correct or not, how this is done? We collect data in support of the theory or as the if the particular theory suggests something, we collect some data which which the theory says uh, or the very which the theory predicts that this is what the, uh, the particular experiment is going to say. So, we collect data in its response, test that data and test the hypothesis. If the hypothesis is uh, verified or if the hypothesis is, uh, uh, is, is supported by the data, then we say that the theory is correct. Otherwise, we want to reform the theory or we reformulate the theory. Another interesting thing in terms of uh, in terms of research or scientific research is falsification criteria. Now, what is the falsification criteria? Now, the hypothesis which is derived from a theory, it should have the possibility or it should have the possibility, the probability of being rejected. Hypothesis are as I said, these are tentative solutions. So, any hypothesis which has been said or which have been proposed, they uh, they all should all always have a chance to being rejected, only then it is a scientific research. So, theory must make predictions that can be disconfirmed by data. If we make a hypothesis which, uh, which is always confirmed by data, then it is not a right way of doing research. So, basically any hypothesis that we predict should always have the possibility of being disconfirmed. And this basically is called the 
falsification or the falsifiability criteria of research. So, any hypothesis that we make this is, this is a this is a viable solution, but this is a tentative solution which basically means that the chances are that we can always reject this particular hypothesis and then reconfirm the theory or predict more hypothesis out of it. And that is why that we when we do research we never have one hypothesis, we have multiple hypotheses to test because there are multiple solutions right. So, we do not have just one hypothesis to go about and say that this is correct, can never prove a theory true, but can prove it false. So, hypothesis gives a possibility or a probability that a particular theory is correct, but it never says that it is 100 percent correct. We never have the probability 1, but we all we can have a probability of 0. We can always say that the theory is wrong in terms of the hypothesis, but the hypothesis can never with full evidence or conformity say that a theory is or is truly correct. Also, theories that cannot be falsified cannot be considered as scientific because then they become facts. If you have theories like the sun will rise in the east, if that is what it is and you want to test this theory, now this is going to happen till the earth rotates. And so, in this kind of things, there is no point in making a hypothesis because then what happens is this is not a scientific theory to look at. And so, this is a fact that we know and so it becomes fact. And so, that is why uh, a theory should be a should be able to be falsified. Two other things that we do in research or we use in research is the process of induction and deduction. Now, what is induction? Specification or and generalization. So, if we have a large set of data and from there if we conclude specific results this is called deduction. But if we have very specific results and from that we forecast or we come up with varied kind of hypothesis or varied kind of uh, results out of it, then that is called induction. So, induction is from specific to general, the process of generalization is called induction and the process of specification is, uh, the, uh, is the, pro the process of deduction. So, if we are coming from specific, a large data set from that if we pinpoint or if we are able to expect extract specific hypothesis or specific results this is called deduction but from very specific results if we if we inflate it if we are able to, uh, if we uh, try to predict a number of solutions out of very specific results or generalize it in a manner then it is called the idea of induction. So, in the, what is induction? Specific examples to general statements. So, if there is a specific example let us say that any spe uh, uh, so uh, like I saw a parrot eat a chili and based on that if I say that all birds eat chilies then this is basically an induction because what I am trying to do is for the bird category I am trying to say that most birds eat chili and this is what I am doing is I am generalizing it. So, observation to theories if you are from one particular observation if you build a theory this is called the process of induction. In deduction a general statement to specific examples and so if, if I say that most birds are able to fly and from there if we reduce the statement that ostrich can fly whereas they cannot then what I am doing is I am mistaking and I am using the process of deduction. So, since most birds fly and if that is the characteristic feature of a bird from there or defining feature of a bird and from there if I am trying to say that ostriches can fly which is actually or kimu can fly uh, in emu can fly which is also a bird then what I am doing is I am doing a deduction and in induction what happens is we from theory to hypothesis. So, if you are coming from theory to hypothesis we are doing deduction, but if we are taking observations and from there we are building up theory then we tend to do something called inductions. So, scientists they make observations to detect patterns from which they propose a theory, then they generate the hypothesis which then pred, uh, which are predictions about future observations. So, first they collect some observe something and from that observation they give a theory and then they generate hypothesis based on the theories and predict future observations. These new observations called experiments test hypothesis and provide evidences for or against the theory. So, based on certain kind of data I give certain kind of theory and then based on the predictions of a theory I run experiments and then validate the theory is how the research is exactly done. The process from patterns to theory involves induction while the process from theory to hypothesis involves reduction. As you can see this is my theory, this is my observation. So, if I start with observation look at patterns build a theory in and do hypothesis and experiments and then again come to observation is what I am doing is deduction. If I start this way 
uh, I do induction. If I start the other way around from theory, if I go to hypothesis, then observations and then patterns again coming back to theory, what I am doing is actually deduction and so these are the two basic forms or two basic types of doing research. So, we will take two experiments and I will explain further on how experiments are designed in language and any behavioral sciences. So, we look at the, the basic of experimentation in uh, behavioral sciences and we'll for that purpose we will look at the investigation of short term memory capacity to classic examples from the field of cognitive psychology or memory and we will take these as our model systems and explain to you how research is done or experiments are planned. So, the two experiments that we are taking is first STM capacity short term capacity as number of items Miller 1956. So, Miller gave something called the magical number which is 7 plus or minus uh, 2. These are the number of chunks of item which is stored in short term memory. So, this is the most number of items that you can show, uh, store in your short term memory or working memory that is what the definition was not working memory, but short term memory. So, this is what they were testing how many items can be stored in short term memory. The other that we are doing the other experiment that we are try, trying to uh, look at is Alan Bradley's experiment which says that what is the length of time for which items can get stored in short term memory and remember this is a very classic experiment and based <coughs> on this experiment the whole idea of working memory was developed. So, let us look at these model experiments. The hypothesis was people can hold 7 items in uh, it should be 7 plus or minus 2, but let us take go with 7. So, 7 items in STM this is what the hypothesis was. The test was in a digit span test. So, in a digit span test what really happens a number of digit appears to you one by one and you will have to commit these digits to memory and later on reveal or retrieve those digits. So, that is what a digit span task is in front of you you will have a computer and so number of digits will come. So, one digit, a two digit, a three digit, a four digit sequence and so as the number of digits increases what you have to do is remember them and retrieve them back and so we will what we want to see is uh, we want to see how many digits can you actually remember or can you hold in your memory. People can re, uh, reliably repeat 7 digits and from this, this test it was found out that 7 is the maximum number of digits that anybody can hold in short term memory or for a brief period of time. We will not come to the time hypothesis, but how many items which are there. And the interpretation of the result was results support the hypothesis and from these results we were able to support the hypothesis that STM capacity is limited. The idea the question was whether STM can store a number of items infinite items or if it cannot then what is the actual capacity of short term memory and from this experimentation we were able to come up with the interpretation was since 7 is the is the number of digits that most people who took part is the mean number of responses or mean number of digits that people were comfortable in retrieving back after doing the digit span task. So, this is what the result was. Similarly, there was another experiment uh, with how long can you hold the digits in short term memory and this is called Bradley's experiment. And so, here the hypothesis was people can hold about 2 seconds of information in STM that was what the hypothesis was. So, how long the from based on research previous researches it was believed that 2 seconds is the time of information storage in short term memory. The test was people can repeat about 7 short words only 2 or 3. Uh, only 2 or 3 long words. So, if we give very short words then people can remember or repeat 7 short words and but if it is longer words uh, with 5, 6, 7 digit, uh, letters in it or 8 or 10 letters in it then only 2 or 3 long words can be repeated and that was the uh, test that we people were uh, asked to do and based on that the interpretation is results falsify Miller's hypothesis support Bradley's hypothesis that it is not so, this is this is also an example of falsification. What Miller found out is that irrespective of time people were able to hold 7 plus or minus 2 items and here it was found out that only 2 or 3 items is what people were able to hold and so time was of essence and not the capacity. So, short term memory was not a capacity driven store which means that it was not dependent on capacity rather it is a time dependent store. So, the more number of iterations the longer it was so STM was defined in terms of how long can an information be stored it was not defined or it was not uh, 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 dependent on how many words can be retrieved. So, by taking these experiments we will progress further and explain to you the whole process of doing research. So, 
what are the methods of science or what are the basic techniques that we use in science the first technique that we use is something called the naturalistic observation and so what is naturalistic observation these are used for this is the process of observing and describing a phenomena so if there is a phenomena if there is a particular experiment or if there is a particular set of observation which is out there and we cannot go in there and do any manipulation what we do is we stay away and look at what is happening and from that we collect data let us say that we want to see how a certain tribe speaks or what is the uh, way in which sentences are comprehended sentences are produced or what is the language of a particular tribe now since we cannot go and meet with these tribe and we cannot go and intervene with them and we do not know their language so basically the best we can do is we stay away somewhere and observe while a phenomena while they are exchanging their language and this is called naturalistic observation since we go to that particular tribe and from a very distance watch on how they are producing sentences or producing whatever of our nature of interest is this is called naturalistic observation the goal here is to describe so the main uh, goal of naturalistic observation is describing the particular phenomena of describing how this happens that is the uh, best uh, naturalistic observation can do because it collects a lot of data and from there it will form data sets and describe so it is exploratory in nature we are exploring nothing is out there and so we are still exploring then we have something called correlational methods in correlational methods what we do it is a mathematical technique that seeks patterns in data now let us say that we have no variables to start with we do not know what is happening so we, we want to study how people in a particular tribe how do they communicate with each other with English language with any other language we have very set rules we very set uh, uh, paradigms of language we have very set um, uh, evidences and experiments will develop experiments to study how language is produced comprehended meaning extracted from it information passed on and all those things are uh, therefore uh, languages which are known to the world but then if we have a tribe somewhere in africa or somewhere somewhere far off place which has not come in close contact with the real world we want to see how language develops or how people use language there what we do is uh, we have nothing to start with because uh, the rules that we have for the English language or for any other language may not apply there. So, what we do is we first go in and look at when they are communicating and from there collect as much data or look at the phenomena the most closely that we can and record that phenomena. This is called exploratory research. Now, when we do that from that particular the number of data points that we have the type of data that we have from that we will run a correlation. Correlation is the basically a technique in which we find commonality between various variables of interest. Now, what is a variable? A variable is uh, something which varies. So, the things of interest the points of interest we find commonality between them and that is what is called correlation. In correlation what we do is since we have so much data and since we have so much data points what we do is we run a correlation generally we use something called factor analysis in, in doing it and so when run a correlation then we will find bunches of data or sets of data points which accumulate together and form categories and then they are clubbed together this is how the factor analysis also works so they are clubbed together to form the factors of that particular data set so in exploratory research we collect a lot of data and then we run uh, correlations on them and based on the correlation data points which correlate highly they will accumulate together to form data sets or to form clear cut uh, groups within that uh, number of data points and these groups are what are called the factors or these are, these are what are the uh, points of interest or these are the variables of interest for us. So, it is a mathematical technique that sits pattern in data or so basically then refining our sentence we find patterns and though uh, the goal here is prediction. So, once we are able to find patterns these patterns will then predict that this is the kind of language that they are using or this is the kind of rule that they are using for the language that they have in this particular community and so that is what the correlation is all about and once a prediction has been done once we have these predictions or once we have these uh, variables of interest or these patterns we actually take these patterns and then manipulate 
things in patterns or within the pattern itself we manipulate the IV that is what we call in experimentation, but here what we do is we manipulate something in, in those patterns. So, we change those patterns by certain degrees and see how a particular behavior of interest changes and so that is what the experimental method is all about. So, this is from here we uh, look at observation we build a theory from this theory we produce a hypothesis and then we test the hypothesis in this and the experimentation method. So, means of systematically testing hypothesis in control situation what we do is now we take that patterns and based on that patterns we bring these tribes into the lab and then manipulate those variables or those data patterns when we do that a particular kind of response will get generated. So, if, if it is accuracy we are looking at if it is reaction time we are looking at or some other variables of interest. So, that is what we look at and we test this hypothesis whatever hypothesis we generate out of correlation and this the goal of this particular thing is called explanation. So, theory building naturalistic observation correlation producing hypothesis experimental methods are testing the hypothesis based on that we produce models and theories. So, what is a model based on the experimentations we then generate a model. So, models are simply simple versions of phenomena under the study. So, most theories are expressed as models and so which are attempt to explaining the underlying mechanism typically in the form of a graph a set of mathematical equations or computer simulation. So, basically models are simplified uh, versions of a particular phenomena which is under study and this happens in terms of either a graph, a set of equations or a computer program. So, a model could be explained in terms of a graph for example, y equals to mx plus c is a form of a model or y equals to r uh, r 1 x 1 plus r 2 x 2 plus something if it is a polynomial. So, it will be uh, r 1 plus x 1 plus r x 2 square x 3 something something and then an error. So, this is basically a model and this model basically explains the how we manipulate this x 1 x 2 x 3 to generate y that is what the model explaining and this is called a linear model. Similarly, we can have lean non linear model. So, basically a model could be a graph a simple graph is a model or we can have a set of equations like this or we could have a sometimes we have computer programs also for example, a c t r or a c t star or soar all of these are computer models of cognitive processes or how cognitions really work. So, these kind of models are generated and what is model? It is a very simple or the very basic phenomena of a uh, of a particular uh, is a, a particular thing that we are studying or a particular uh, question which we are investigating. Now, computer models what are computer models? They mimic behavior under the particular study. So, computer models are uh, what they will do is they will have they will have external inputs or they will have computer in uh, basically uh, some kind of an input and they will generate an output. So, it is basically computer models are those kind of models which takes in a number of input and based on that build the whole theory out of it. So, uh, these are called computer simulations and they help overcome unwarranted assumptions flaw in logic. So, why we do we make computer models? We make computer models because computer models are very effective and very cost uh, and very logical in sense. So, when you make instead of testing a model or instead of testing a particular prediction of a theory in the actual subject because once we do that and if it fails then maybe the subject does not respond. So, what we do is we, sim we simulate the situation in a computer the same kind of phenomena the same kind of results that we are expecting in a computer and we gather results from it and from the results we see or we try to assess what is the problem that we are facing what is the kind of logic that we are using where is the computer failing and it will produce results. So, until the point of time that it produces the results that we want or it gives us some kind of of a results we never actually go ahead and test the model on the actual data point. So, computer models help us in unwarranted assumptions when we are making false assumptions we will get something because computer models we can verify we can rerun the model for example, look at AC the way procedural memory and declarative memory is described in ACTR and essence concept uh, in terms of the spatial uh, uh, the the uh, special code and the propositional code uh, the way it is described in ACTR uh, this basically is a good explanation of how a computer model really works or how they can solve problems in the real world and also flaws in logic can be pointed out by computer programs. Now, models and theory good models lend plausibility to a theory if, if you have a good model it will always build up a theory and only data can support or falsify a theory. So, once we have a theory we then go collect data based on what the theory is saying and then we either falsify the theory or we 
rebuild the theory or if it, it will never be true in any sense. So, we, we overcome try to overcome assumptions or, or we try to overcome the limitations of a theory and build up a good theory for any kind of data. Constructs are another interesting thing in, in uh, research. So, what is a construct? A construct provides a, a scientist with a useful way of thinking about the world and so basically what a construct gives is it, 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 it gives a outline or it gives a way in which <coughs> scientists think about external uh, or the outside world. So, constructs they label uh, given to a set of observation that seem to be related. So, constructs are basically formats in which scientists are able to uh, conceptualize or think about the external world or think about phenomena in the external world. So, memory, attention, intelligence, personality, even language are constructs. So, these are phenomena which are there and when these phenomena are uh, made in a process or <coughs> understood a certain process that is what a construct is all about. Another interesting thing or uh, in, in, in line with construct are something called operational definition. So, what is operational definition and this is very important at least in social sciences. Why it is important is that let us say I study a phenomena. Now, when I study a particular phenomena, let us say I am studying happiness. Now, when I am studying happiness, it may be possible that there are certain other researchers which are studying happiness. And so, when the results that I give, I have to say that this is the way I operationalize my defin definition of happiness. Let us say when I say happiness, I say my happiness is bound by A, B, C, D characteristic. Right? So, happiness is when you will have a certain kind of uh, elevated feeling, higher arousal, certain kind of uh, body structures or facial effect and so on and so forth. Certain other researchers would also be doing and they would say that A, B, C, D may not be the primary uh, way in which happiness is defined and E, F, G is the primary way. And so, when I operationalize the definition, I say that my way of defining happiness is in based on A, B, C, D and not D, E, F, G and that, that is why my theory of happiness or the my experiments in happiness results from my experiment may not fit in some other experiment. This basically is what is operationalizing a definition. So, it defines the construct in terms of how it is <coughs> measured. So, I say my happiness is measured in terms of A, B, C, D and so some other people may say that it is measured in E, F, G and so <coughs> that is a difference that can happen. For example, let us look at intelligence. So, intelligence is based on scores on tests and this is what is operational line. So, my intelligence is based on scores of a test. Some people would believe that intelligence is not based on scores of tests, it may be based on something else and so on and so forth. So, defining intelligence as IQ or scores on a particular test is one way of operationalizing the definition of intelligence. Also, short term memory capacity is, uh, is measured in terms of digit span or it can also be measured in terms of time and so these two definitions <coughs> or these two ways of measuring my uh, short term memory is what is the operationalizing the definition. Now, another important point that we need to know in doing research in language or other social sciences is the concept of something called validity and reliability and so what are these? What is validity? The degree to which instrument measures what it is claimed to measure. Now, let us say that I, I develop a test, I develop a test of intelligence and when I give it to people, the test does not measure intelligence. It could be that I have questions which are not related to intelligence at all. So, I develop a test of academic intelligence and it does not ask questions based on uh, let us say reasoning or, or verbal reasoning and that kind of a thing. Now, the, in that case, my test is said to be not valid. So, if my test of intelligence, academic intelligence does not have questions or does not have questions related to academic, academics or intelligence in academics, then it is said to be an invalid scale. And so, how do we measure validity? What we do is when I have a test of intelligence, I take my new test and run it against a test which is already there in the market, which is suppose or which claims to measure. Uh, intelligence or academic intelligence and when the scores are correlated and we find uh, quite uh, agreement between the two cores, uh, the two tests that, that are there, the one which is pre-existing and the one that I have developed, I say that my test is having a validity because then what it is doing is it is 
measuring the same thing that the other test is doing and the other test is a well established test of intelligence academic intelligence and so if the scores are in range or basically are correlated highly or uh, are e some way uh, significantly correlated with each other <coughs> i say my test is valid now for example let's look at bathroom scales now if bathroom scale is not able to measure it is valid for measuring weight so if in a bathroom scale i stand and it doesn't give me weight then what is the point of that scale so uh, it's valid for measuring weight and so in a bathroom scale when i stand it, it only measures intelligence and not measuring intelligence so when I stand on a scale and it says a weight of 80, this 80 is the weight, is the body weight. Now, let us say that what it is giving is my IQ, then it is a wrong assumption because bathroom scales, the weight has no correlation with IQ and what the intelligence, what the test bathroom scale is doing is measuring your IQ and in this case, this test is or this particular thing is not valid. Another interesting thing is called the reliability. Now, whatever you are focusing on today should be a measure of your designing experiments in uh, learning or any behavioral sciences. So, whether it is uh, designing the hypothesis, whether it is using a, a theory, how do you use a theory, how experimentations are done and towards the end of this uh, section, I will tell you about how experiments are done, how what is an experimental design in those kind of a thing. So, and then we should whenever we are developing a test or an experiment, we should be always be aware of what is the validity and reliability of the scale or the experiment that we are doing. Now, what is reliability again? So, validity is basically what my test is claiming to measure and what is measuring and reliability is the degree to which instrument gives consistent measurement for the same thing. Now, let us say I have a bathroom scale and I stand on it and it gives my weight as 80. The next time I, so this is my first reading. If I go to the second reading, it says 85. Then I go here and then it says 90. Then I go here, it says 70. Then I go here again, it says 80, then 85. What is happening is my test is not reliable or my scale is not reliable or it is not been calibrated properly. What is calibration? It is the process of sensitizing a particular instrument and so that is what it is and so this is not an, it is a non-sensitive scale and nobody would like a scale like that. So, when an instrument gives consistent measure, now the range of error could be plus or minus 2 kgs. So, if, if it is in the range of 78 to 82 that my weight is with the same machine always then I say it is a reliable scale. But suppose it keeps on throwing me 70, 60, then 90, then whatever it wants every day then it is not reliable. So, basically maintaining consistency if I do an experiment and that experiment if I am repeating it again if it is giving some weird result and it keeps on giving different different results on different different uh, replications of the same experiment then it does not has reliability. So, reliability is basically acquiring the more or less same results over multiple repetitions. So, daily measurements of a bathroom scale is if it is 143, 285, 37, 196 it is not a reliable scale, but if it is 157, 155, 156 and 158 it is a reliable scale. Now, this happens because of sensitivity and so sensitivity of scales would vary and so it will give you plus or minus. 5 percent error that is what the error range is, but if it is more than that then it is a non-reliable scale. Now, before doing an experiment we have to come up with something called a hype uh, experimental design. So, what is an experimental design uh, and before that we have to uh, know about what are experiments. So, what are experiments? Experiments are uh, tightly controlled situation design to test the hypothesis. So, what are experiments? Experiments are uh, way of controlling a number of variables, a number of factors that are extraneous. Now, what is extraneous factors? Extraneous factors are those factors which may harm or which may interfere with the result if we do not control it. Let us say we are measuring the uh, speed of reading of a person. Now, the speed of reading of a person may be affected by intelligence may be affected by the number of books that he has read, may be affected by um, uh, the digit span, may be affected by so many things. So, if, if we want a truly uh, a true test of reading span of how um, uh, uh, quickly somebody reads or how quickly uh, the eye reads and the brain is able to the eye mind hypothesis of how many is able to make meaning out of it, we need to 
neutralize these factors of intelligence, digit span, uh, previous experiences and all and so we control for those variables. So, what is experiment? Experiment is we control for all variables of interest or all variables of interest non-interest which may interfere with the results of our experiment and we control those and then manipulate only one variable. So, we variable, uh, we manipulate the variable uh, that is the in, in a reading span or in a in a, in a in a in a in a reading span test what we do is how quickly you can read a variable so we'll give different uh, let's say uh, different presentation times. So, we will present the same sentence for different presentation time and we will see how quickly you can read a particular variable. And so, this if this is the interest uh, that how quickly can you read a particular um, sentence and then generate meaning out of it what what we want is or what we can do is we can vary the presentation time and then uh, maybe it, uh, control for intelligence, age and those kind of thing. As age develops the more repertoire you develop the more uh, chances that you will be able to rightly predict a particular uh, sentence and so we control for that and then what we do is we present these uh, the sentences in different different speed to the same intelligence people or uh, balanced intelligence people and they be able to generate a particular hypothesis out of it. So, basically it is a tightly control situation designed to test a particular hypothesis. It is a comparison between two groups that are treated differently. So, basically then I will have a group in which, so first I will control all variables of no interest or we call them extraneous variable in research and then what we will do is we will have two groups. The experimental group will see variations in speed of presentation of the sentences and the control group will have one standard speed and then later on we will see how accurately are you able to produce the sentence back or able to comprehend the gist whatever your question of interest is. And so, my experimental group is the group in which you are making the manipulation and control group is the group in which you are not making manipulation. So, we are controlling between two groups that are treated differently. So, in this group we are making the manipulations in this group we are not making the manipulation. And so, uh, that is that is how we do again we will look at <coughs> Bradley and <coughs> Branford study and we will see how these things work. So, basically then experimental design hypothesis are derived from a theory by the logical process of deduction An experiment is then designed to test this hypothesis this is how the process of we generate an experiment. Now, experiments compare the performance of different groups the experimental group is given a different treatment to test the hypothesis. The control group goes without the treatment in order to provide a baseline of the comparison. Now, what is an experiment? An experiment can be viewed as a stimulus response test and we will we'll look at IVs and DVs further. So, basically that is how an experiment is and so what we are trying to do is we are trying to, to take two basic classic studies and we will uh, talk about how these uh, experiments were done and what are the variables and what how this experiment what are the uh, extraneous variables interest variables what are the factors in doing an experiment. So, one is we have Bradley 1975 study this is the hypothesis here was STM capacity limited by length uh, not number of words. So, how many words are there that is not of interest how much length of the word is and the method is group A repeats short term words group B repeats long term words as, as I said basically what we did was if this is what my thing is I create two groups my first group looks at short term words see, see if it is the question is whether word length not number of word is the reason or, or, or is, is what determines STM capacity. I create two groups better it would be to create three groups in one group I have short uh, length words in the other group I have long length words and the third I will have intermediate words. So, basically then I can have three groups or I can have two groups only let us since we are focusing on Bradley study. So, he had one group looking at uh, 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 a short word. So, maybe 2 plus or minus 1 word and then 7 plus or minus 2 word kind of a thing and then that is what how the experiment was done that is the method. In Brantford and Johnson's 1972 study the hypothesis was context aid ambiguous story comprehension. The question here was whether context let us say that I am talking about 
um, I am randomly talking about something. So, I am telling you that after this, I am telling you a story. So, after this you you take some powder, put it into the machine, put things onto it and then it, it goes round and round, takes in water and something, something. Until I, sh I show you the, the photo of a washing machine, you will not be able to comprehend that I am talking about the washing machine. And so, that is what we were trying to see that whether context, whether the picture of certain things can lead to ambiguous story comprehension. So, basically can the photo of it or can some kind of context on which the story is being said uh, that context help us in, in making meaning out of ambiguous sentences. The method here was group A was sees the picture, hears the story, group B hears the story, no picture. So, the group when they see a picture they immediately find out that this is what the washing machine is or they see a washing machine and then they hear the story. So, they are able to narrate the fact that this whatever description is coming off is coming off about the particular uh, washing or the washing process. The, when group B hears the story, the random story and does not see the washing machine, they have no idea that we are talking about the washing machine. Now, for any experiment to proceed, most experiments have two type of groups. One is called the experimental group and the other is called the control group. Let us say I want to do an experiment, any experiment which is there. And when I want to do an experiment, the first thing is that I have to define the variables of interest. Let us say the variable of interest is whether speed of sentence presentation <coughs> influences. So, speed of sentence presentation influences comprehension if that is what we, uh, my uh, question is. So, speed of sentence presentation is the IV because that is what we will me measure and sentence comprehension which is how nicely you can read a sentence or how nicely you can retrieve a sentence back get the gist of the sentences what is my uh, DV <coughs> this, is called the <coughs> this is called my <coughs> DV. So, IV is the speed of sentence presentation and DV is the sentence comprehension. So, <coughs> then what we do is we can we create two groups. Experimental group is the group in which I will vary the speed of presentations. So, I will take a sentence and present it for let us say 1 minute, 2 minutes, 3 minutes or let us say 100 of a mill, uh, 1000 of a millisecond, 100 of a millisecond, 500 of a millisecond, 1000 millisecond, 2000 millisecond and so on and so forth. In the control group, I do not manipulate my IV. So, I have a fixed IV which means that 1000 millisecond is the time in which the sentence is being presented and then I measure the sentence comprehension in terms of how accurately can you reproduce the sentence back and that is what is called the DV. So, what is the experimental condition? Groups that is given treatment to test hypothesis that is called experimental group and control group or control condition is group that is not given the treatment. So, in this case here is the this provides baseline for comparison because this will tell me whether these speeds have any effect or not. Again looking at Bradley and others 1975 study, the experimental group was repeating long words test hypothesis and the control group was repeating short words replicate digit span task. Remember the digit span task in which we found out that it was 2 seconds in which people were able to comprehend that. In the Bradford Johnson study 1972, the experimental group was sees picture, hears stories, test hypothesis and control group was they hear the story and no picture. As I said, the control group would not see the picture but hear the story but my experimental group would hear the story as well as see the picture. And so, this is what the difference between my uh, control group and experimental group is all about. Now, uh, let us also look at since we have taken up the idea of what an IV and DV is. Now, first of all what is a variable? So, any equation in this form, any function in this form is called a variable. So, this x and y are variable what it is saying is x is a uh, the uh, function of x is y. So, when I replace, when I put values of, when I manipulate values of x, I will get values of y and so this is what a variable is. So, variable is anything that keeps on changing and so independent variable is the variable that we manipulate, that we change. So, in, in, in our uh, the speed of presentation test, the speed at which we present the sentences is what is called the IV and dv is the 
just the comprehension the retrieval of sentences that you are doing which is called the dv so my independent variable is various types of treatment given to different groups in experiment and my dependent variable is measurement of responses of each participants makes to that particular treatment in my bradley experiment the iv was short words are long words and dv were number of words correctly recalled so this is called accuracy and these are the manipulation of so word length is what the manipulation is in my Bradford and Johnson study the picture and no picture so basically it is called picture stimuli since both the groups heard the story the only thing that we are manipulating is the picture versus non picture and so here picture versus non picture is my IV and DV is subjective rating or difficulty number of items recall again it is accuracy how correctly how many words can you correctly recall and uh, Let us lastly look at something called uh, between subject and within subject designs and then we will look at hypothesis testing maybe in the next uh, class. So, basically then there are two type of designs that we use. So, sometimes what happens is it is very difficult to control for within subject for uh, subject factors. Let us say that uh, there are certain uh, there are certain kind of experiments which require the same subject to be repeated because certain subject factors may be responsible for the different results where that we are getting and in those cases we use something called a within subject design. So, if the same subject is being repeated both in the control group as well as the experimental group this is called a within subject design, but if the different subjects come into the experimental group and the control group this is called a between subject design. So, what is a between subject design assigns each participants to only one condition whereas a within subject design assigns each participant to every condition. Now, it, if it may be possible that there is one factor that we are interested in and that factor uh, uh, is may be uh, may become different for different people and so what we do is to preserve the sanity of it we repeat the same subject across different conditions different testing and this is called the between subject design. So, uh, let us again look at Bradley's experiment. So, in Bradley's experiment each participant repeats both short word and long words uh, on separate trials and this is a within subject design and then Bradford and Johnson uh, and same participants see picture, some participants see picture, some do not and hear the same story. So, they use a within subject design. Now, hypothesis testing is something that we will do in the next class and look at um, further. So, let us quickly then briefly go over what we did in today's class. So, other than uh, going back and telling you about what we did in the first class and reviewing with the first class. In the present class what we did was we looked at how experiment uh, are designed or how experiments are done, what are the various uh, factors or what are the various uh, constraints of an of a particular scientific research experiment. We looked at the conditions under which an experiment is done, we looked at the mechanisms of doing an experiment, we looked at the process of induction and induction, how uh, what are theories, what is a hypothesis, what is a uh, experimental design, what type of experimental designs are there and we took some model systems, we took some model experiments and looked at how these experiments fit into the conceptualization of experimentation that we have been uh, talking about. In the next class onwards, we will look at uh, uh, how hypothesis testing is actually done and we will further look at, we will take some examples from language and see how to construct an experiment and look at some experiments which have been done in the language and discuss those experiments in detail. So, in all we will tell you, uh, uh, I will tell you within two, these two lectures how research is done in, uh, in, uh, in uh, language in specifically in language and generally in any behavioral sciences. So, up till we meet again in the next class it is goodbye from here. Thank you.